Welcome back to your Thursday Buckeye Talk from Cleolubin.com. Team Baird versus Team Means. We are drafting 44 players from the Ohio State roster. It is our version of a spring game draft. Ryan Day keeps teasing us. There were coaches, I think Jim Knowles earlier in the spring mentioned, oh, yeah, we sit down and we draft players. It was like, what? And then Ryan Day on Wednesday said, oh, we sit down and we draft offensive players to figure out, like, whether we should use three receivers or or three tight ends. It was like, can you we can we televise these things? What are you doing? So we're going to do that version of a draft because there, I think it's one of the best ways to find out what we think about the team by drafting the players. So Nathan and Steven are each going to draft a full offense, a full defense, however they want to do that. Three receivers, one tight end, two receivers, two tight end. Do they want to run three linebackers in their system? That's fine. I'm going to fill the role that I was born to fill, which is to sit back, be unaccountable, and rip everybody. So I'm just going to analyze the picks. We have 44 picks to make. If we go two minutes a pick, that's an hour and a half podcast. So we want to get scooting. And we'll do that by me holding up either one or two fingers. And Nathan, I swear I'm not lying. You pick. Am I holding up one or two fingers? One. It's two. So that means, Stephen, you can pick. We're doing a slight modified, not a snake. So the person who picks first, it'll be first, then second and third together, then fourth and fifth together, then six, then seven, eight, nine, ten, back and forth. So, Stephen, do you want to pick first or do you want two and three together? Pick it first. All right. Let's begin our draft. And I will say, oh, by the way, in my analyst mode, that I'm in full analyst mode right now. I just want to say doing this draft and thinking about what I, I was like, I'll make my list of my top guys so I can like check in and see if I agree or disagree with you guys in doing so. I realized this is a weird team. This yeah. is a weird team, which Nathan, you and I kind of covered on that podcast about how they might have a million people at the combine next year. And they're all going to be fourth rounders. This team has, a lot of good football players. But I tried to make a list of the guys where I was like, man, like there really is a separation between maybe like the top guy at a position and everybody next. I got to four. So <laughs> there's like, I have no idea who the sixth pick in this draft is going to be. I'm not sure who I know the fourth pick in this draft is going to be because I think you can go a million different ways because this team has a lot of good players, but not many that I think we are 100% sure are great players and so much greater than everybody else at their position. Except for the guy that Steven's going to take first. Go ahead, Steven. <laughs> Part of me wants to do what I did the first time we ever did one of these when I took Garrett Wilson first, which, love you, Garrett, and just take another wide receiver. But I just... Positional value is going to be such an emphasis in this draft that I have to take the positional value. I'm taking Donovan Jackson with the first pick. I have to guarantee myself at least what? one guaranteed what? solid offensive lineman. This is catastrophic. It. This is, is a catastrophic misfire by Stephen Means. No, it's not. Wow. The books. We're talking about the guy, literally. Can I just explain what happened here? We're talking about yeah. a player who literally – if he were in the NFL draft right now, might be the number one pick. He is not the number one pick in the Ohio State draft. I am flabbergasted. <laughs> I cannot. This is as shocked as I have ever been on Buckeye Talk. We're <laughs> doing news bulletins across the bottom. Nathan, can you text us? Get real quick. Can you text us? <laughs> <Steven? laughs> Donovan I Jackson. I can't text you because I'm sprinting up the aisle with the card to hand in my first pick. No. So, so, but, so, okay, so let's, all right, let's spend 15 minutes on this. We're going four hours. <laughs> <laughs> what is the thinking here, Stephen, on bypassing generational talent Marvin Harrison Jr. to take Donovan Jackson with the first pick? Marvin Harrison is the best player on this football team. Hands down, it's no doubt about that. I understand that. But, Right now, when we're talking about comfort level of being able to play the game of football, I am a lot more comfortable with other guys not named Marvin Harrison Jr. at that position than I am. It gets really slim at, at the offensive line very quickly here. 
So you can have the best you can have the best player on on the team and maybe even the country, but he's also a guy who's very dependent on someone else to get him the ball, who is very dependent on someone else protecting them so he can get that man the ball. There's so many other variables here with Marvin Harrison Jr. that with other people, it's like if Donovan Jackson is just really good at his job, he's really good at his job. Marvin Harrison to be maximized needs other people to also be good at their job. This to me feels like that, Stephen, you are trying to shake the convention of like, ah, that Stephen Means guy, he loves receivers. And it's yeah. like if, if, if you wore a suit every day and everybody was like, man, Stephen Means is so uptight. Why does he wear a suit to interviews every day? He has a little kerchief in his breast pocket and he wears a vest sometimes. He wore like a three-piece suit. And we were like, Stephen, man, relax. Why do you? And then one day you showed up in a Speedo. And you were like, okay, no more suits. It's like, well, not that far. So Steven is shaking off that guy loves receivers to take Donovan Jackson. I will say if I really had four people, the top four people at their positions where I felt like there was a gap, Donovan Jackson was one of them. Donovan Jackson is the first pick in our draft. Nathan has an opportunity here with picks two and three. We'll see what he does. Nathan, go ahead. Well, (laughs) pick two is Marvin Harrison Jr., obviously. Um, and now my decision is whether I want to do what Steven did, which is, uh, lean towards where I think there might be positional, um, scarcity or whether I could help create some. And, uh, I think it'd be fun. So I'll just take a Mecca Booga here too. That's the move. That is the move. That's a shiv. That is, I absolutely think that's the move. I had a Mecca fifth on my list. So he's at the same position as Marvin. So my list, I had Marvin one, Donovan four, a Mecca five. But this is, I think, justifiable on the merits, Nathan, of like how good of a player a Mecca is. But also there's some strategy here. But honestly, if we were just saying like, we're not doing a draft, we're just making our lists of, let's all list the 25 best players on this team. I think you could make a case for a Mecca this high, Nathan, as he's this good, because he might be the second best receiver in the country. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's kind of what I'm thinking. Like, you, you, you've you, already got a consensus or unanimous All-American, and then you've got the guy who, on any other team, putting up the same numbers would, would be the, the standout guy. So, um, and also, I, I think you're right. that if, if you're just talking about pure football player, that's kind of how I was thinking about this still at this point. Like, it's just pure football player. Throw out the positions. There's some other guys who you could make a very strong case for here, but you can also make the case for a Mecca. All right, so that brings us to pick four, and this is going to – well, it'll be interesting to see how the rest of the receivers shake out, how far they fall. There certainly are many other receivers worth drafting, but, Stephen, we're going to go to you for picks four and five before we get into our back and forth. So where are you going here? Before I make this pick, is Emeka in the slaughter at Z for you? Doesn't I mean, matter. He doesn't yet. have to declare that now. He doesn't have to declare that now. You make your roster. who I draft later. That's fair. That's fair. Uh, I'll go defense. I'm taking JT. It's my fourth pick. I, I had JT second on my list. And I think mm-hmm. Steven Wright, and this is – Jack Sawyer's yeah. a good player. There are other good players at defensive end. But it feels like with what he's put down as in his career so far and also what he could be, it feels like there's separation here, right, which is why he's this high in this draft. We did a dude pod. He's one of the few dude moments guys on this team who's had at least a dude moment that gave you at least some hope that maybe he can get consistent with it. So I think he comes into this season arguably the best defensive player on this team. I mean, Tommy Eichenberg might have something to say about that, but I think he's the best defensive player on this team. And if those were how the top three picks are going to go, then he should probably go fourth. Yeah, I think I think that's right. So we'll give the fifth pick to you, Steven, and then we'll start in the back and forth here. So who are you going here? Hmm. Maybe I should just take both edge rushers. Actually, I'm going to take both edge rushers here. I'm going to take Jack Sawyer for the other side. And a lot of the reason why is – I think it does put some pressure on Nathan here with how he has to approach his offensive line. So I was on the edge when I was making up my list. I think Jack would probably be sixth on my list. I only did a top five. Um, but now, I mean, experience-wise, right, we're talking about yeah. these are only, these are the two defensive ends who have played. 
and now Nathan's going to be picking young guys. And Nathan, even the idea that like Ryan Day was saying, they have five defensive ends for the spring game on Saturday, which is part of why they're not they're not drafting teams because they they wouldn't be deep enough. They're just going to rotate, you know, those five defensive ends as they need to through the ones and the twos, and it'll all work out. But this is Nathan a position of scarcity a little bit. It is, but 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 also. Um... I mean, we've seen enough from the likes of Caden Curry, the likes of Kenyatta Jackson, that when you have to take somebody like that or 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 um, Mitchell Melton, if you want to jack it up, um, we're, we don't feel like we're taking leftovers there. We feel like there's really enough promise there that those guys are going to be a factor this fall. So um, it's a good strategy, but I, I'm, I'm not that too worried about it. And again, to be clear, everybody's available. So Mitchell Melton is hurt. Tommy Eichenberg hasn't been going, Emeka Buka hasn't been going. We're not worried about that. We're drafting everybody, assuming that if we were really going to get ready to play a game on Saturday and everybody was fully healthy and we were letting it rip, what would that draft look like? I will say, Stephen, I do think there is going to be some temptation within this draft where there may come a point for you or Nathan or both where there's a presumed starter available and you kind of want to take the young guy behind him. Yeah, that's what I was planning on doing anyway, Um, because this is Buckeye talk. We care about what the coaches say when we're providing information. We don't care about what the coaches say when we're just giving our random opinions on draft time. So, yeah, that's what I'm doing anyway. I'm taking the young five stars. (laughs) You were tempted there to be like, ah, sixth pick. I'm just going to take Kenyatta Jackson. Like, I don't know. He's not going to start. Right? I mean, like, there's – like, that's what I would have done. I would have been like, I'm taking Kenyatta Jackson third. But that's going to come up. But it's also, I mean, it's not just us being goofy. It's us telling you something about what we think, Nathan, based on what we've seen, the way people have talked, how we think this fall will play out, what we think would happen if they played a hardcore football game, Ohio State versus Ohio State, on Saturday, that... I don't think we have to be beholden to current depth charts, Nathan, in a world where we've talked about, hey, Jim Knowles is kind of leaning on experience right now and show me something as a two. If we feel like guys have shown something, then go ahead and pick them higher than maybe the depth chart would tell you right now. We know it's going to happen, Nathan, at some point in this draft, right? Yeah, so I would take you back to the last time we did a draft and someone took Sonny Styles and was vilified for it. That's well, not yeah, the same. Sonny Styles, who played like 11 snaps in his yeah, whole that, college football that's career. That's not the same. Just saying. That was also like over multiple seasons, not based just on this roster. roster. So like you and T-Shoe. T-Shoe thinks you're a genius. Staple. Okay. So <laughs> hey, something. T-Shoe knows what he's talking about. Staple. So I'm going to get you a stapler one day, and I'm going to get Sonny Styles <laughs> slash Bryson Shaw <laughs> engraved on the stapler. And you will be like the, uh, for the rest of your I'm life. Gonna be like a Melvin Wadham's, uh, it's going to be like a Melvin Wadham's Halloween costume year round. I just have to carry that around. The guy from uh, Office Space was it Melvin? It, it like it's going to be Mil- um, Milton Wadham's. Like your son at some point, it's going to be like when they're putting dad in the home, and he's going to be yelling to his significant other, "Hey, can we? Do we need to save this style jaw stapler? Does he? Does dad want to take that to the home? So that'll be." Look forward to that. All right, so sixth pick to Nathan Baird. Where are you going? So I hear what Steven's saying about my offensive line, um, but I also am trying to decide if I care um, because maybe the offensive mm. line is just going to be a shambles no matter what we do. Mm. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm kind of going. I'm <laughs> kind this. of. I'm kind of thinking that I want to just take who I think is the best football player. The next up, I, I'm just going to do it. I'll take my call here. Love it. Love it. Oh, that's some bus remnants on that. That is uh, right. <laughs> th- th- there, th- There's a guy. There's one more guy from my list of the top four who's still on the board. That I'll be curious to see when he goes. So my call, not a surprise that he's first up among defensive tackles. Certainly has been running Nathan, right? Well, no, sometimes he doesn't run with the ones. No. Nope. Now, just kind of rotate who are the guys ones at defensive though? tackle more off? Like it's Ty Leak and, uh, and uh, uh, Ty and Hamilton sometimes, Ty Hamilton, but yeah. also sometimes Mike. Yeah, yeah. Ty yeah. Hamilton okay. has been the consistent one. Talik and Mike have had their moments, fair share being with the ones and the twos, but Ty Hamilton has been the consistent guy working with the ones on the defensive line. 
But but we know what the upside is. Mm-hmm. And sometimes if you drive a bus for a person, you can never let them go. All right, so now we're getting in the back and forth range, which will bring us to Steven with pick seven. Where are you going? Yeah, I agree with Nathan. I don't care that much about the offensive line either. It's, it is what it is. Maybe they're good, maybe they're not. So I'm just going to keep taking good football players, and I'm going to take Sonny Styles. Okay, so we got there quickly. So this is uh, people love the potential. And just, Stephen, in your head, do you think right now, even though he's running with the twos when we watch him, that Sonny Styles is the best safety on this team Saturday? You think he'll be the best safety on this team for the opener? Or you think he'll be the best safety on this team by mid-October? I think, yeah, mid-October is probably a good way to put it. I think in the Michigan game, it's without question. He's the best safety on this team. And I don't want to say they're easing themselves into the Sunny Styles experience, but it does feel like they're not just going to throw the kitchen sink at him just for throwing the kitchen sink at him. And a lot, like, because we still have to remember he's technically supposed to be a true freshman early enrollee right now. So they're not rushing that process. But the... The the upside's the upside, and it's just a matter of when that light finally comes on, and I think it comes on sooner than later. And But I do think that because he's so young and he's also – I mean, Lathan Ransom's probably not going to play that much. Josh Proctor, maybe he plays a, a lot, maybe he doesn't, but there's going to be plenty of moments for Sunday Styles to flash on Saturday. I can bank on that just because he's going to get a lot of snaps. Nathan, where was Sunny Styles going to be arranged for you? Close, yeah. close to now, or would you wait longer? I, I don't have a problem with grabbing him here. I probably would. There's some guys that I think I would have taken. I know I would have, would have taken next, but I, 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 I believe in the upside too. I just think that Steven has a good read on this, though. That I'm really curious what we see from him Saturday when when he's unleashed with everybody else and it's out there open field. And I'm really curious about when we get to see them in the fall. Where is he lining or preseason camp? Has has a move? Does a move happen between now? where he is kind of hanging with the twos, et cetera, and preseason camp. Do they start to give him maybe a more prominent role there? Because that would be an indication that it, it is ahead of schedule. If he's still running with the twos through preseason camp, that might tell you that as much good flash, there's also still some rough spots that are having to be worked out, and it'll have to continue through the season. And, Stephen, this is just your option. Do you want to staple Bryson Shaw to Sonny Styles for your team or no? I will not be stapling. No staple. Okay, no staple. No staple. I'm not okay. getting you a stapler. I'll get you another thing to put on your desk, but maybe a pencil just... sharpener. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's, I think that's probably the right call. And if you don't know what we're talking about, go back and listen to the draft of the Ryan Day defensive draft, and you'll uh, get a sense of what it is we mean by this. All right. Eighth pick, Nathan. Where are you going? So I think it is time to put some respect on Tommy Eichenberg's name. You know, a a... a unanimous second team All-American basically last year, if there is such a thing. And if you're talking about just who's going to help you win a football game, like bar none and take out uh, these, the perceived ceiling and all that stuff, he's got to be very, very, very high on that list and maybe should have already been taken. So I'll take Tommy Eichenberg here. I don't think we've forgotten about him. We haven't seen a lot of him. He's been out there doing individual stuff as he recovers from his dual thumb injury. Uh, you talked to him, Nathan, right at the uh, yep. the uh, NIL get an internship thing, and he said his uh, thumbs are still connected to his body. Right? I visual have co- I had visual confirmation that his thumbs are on his body. I did see only surgical scars on one hand, just like a two little dots. So he had something done. He acknowledged he had had some procedure with that hand, the left hand. But uh, I don't know if he had corrective things on both. But clearly a guy who, I mean, it was just, as you might imagine, like as painful as that was, I think it's probably more painful for him every day. He doesn't get to go out and actually hit somebody this spring. And he's he said it's very hard to watch film that you're not in. Your teammates are in it. You're not in it. And you have to go watch this film and learn from it. But it, that's what he's been trying to do this spring. You know what I think would have been a good trick to check out his thumbs surreptitiously? If you would have said to him, hey, who used to be compared to Tough Borland and then became a second-team All-American to see if he said, this guy, 
and then like were his thumbs functional when he did that or if he felt like limited like he did it with his fists or one thumb was sagging off to the side he had hurt thumbs last year and he played through it and like was awesome so i do think eichenberg deserves to be a top 10 pick nathan and something like this tough borland's name did come up in that conversation though because we were talking about what he's going to do after football and i think it's just going to be more football i think he's going to stay i think he's going to coach i think he's going to do strength training something the same as tough borland like the conversations we had about him late in his career what is tough borland doing right now he is a ga at buffalo oh i don't know i think or wisconsin i think it's buffalo okay I'll, i'll double check that so just to double check, there was a moment in a national championship game where a GA at Buffalo covered <laughs> the Heisman winner who was in the Super Bowl this year. So, okay, just double checking how that worked out. Okay, number nine. Steven, where are you going? I'm going to take the other guy who is, I mean, the most locked in starting safety of any of these safeties. I'll take Lights and Ransom here. I, I like, I, I am intrigued by what seems to be happening there. And it feels like Jim Knowles is preparing him to be used as a weapon this year with the physical development that he's gone under, being able to go through another spring, him being that bandit, not a gesture like we maybe thought he would be there. There's some intrigue there. It feels very Tommy Eichenbergish to me in what, how they're going to use Lathan Ransom. Are you fairly certain that you had the two best safeties on the team, Steven? Pretty confident. In that. So there's some strategy here, but also we're taking Lathan Ransom as one of the 10 most valuable, important, best players on this team, if this draft is telling us that. And I don't think that's wrong. I think that's production slash potential. And it feels like this is a reasonable spot for Lathan Ransom. So Nathan, pick 10 to you. Uh, who? Um, I'm torn between a couple three guys here, but I guess I'm going to lean and take Ty Hamilton here as a guy who was starting at the end of last year, has been consistently with the ones this spring. Um, and maybe because I didn't get the two defensive ends, maybe I should take my my first two guys on in the tackle spot. So you guys are getting all strategic here. Because Nathan has the top two receivers, the top two defensive tackles. Steven has the top two defensive ends, the top two safeties. So you guys are clumping your stuff together. Um, and this is one of those, like, like Nathan, this is – I'm not disagreeing with Ty Hamilton as a second defensive tackle off the board. There is a part of me of, like, how big of a gap is there between Ty Hamilton and Ty Leak Williams? I don't – no, like, is that, and again, maybe, I don't know if you're talking about more nose, more three tech, you're trying to pair that up a little bit. I understand that, but this is Nathan part of the issue where there are a lot of positions where you end up kind of trying to splice that a little bit. Well, how good is the second best guy compared to the third best guy? And it's often not that none of them are good. It's that they're both good. So then how do you try to differentiate where the biggest differentiations? I think there's a clear top three at defensive tackle, but you're making a differentiation here between Ty Hamilton and Tyleek Williams. Yeah, I just think, you know, they, they over the course of last season, put a trust in Ty Hamilton, making him a starter. No, my call, my, my call was banged up, too. That was a factor there. But there were times when my call had gotten healthier and, and Ty Hamilton still got the uh, benefit of, of the, being the starter. Uh, down the the stretch last year, and that is kind of I think giving me a gives me a different perspective on what they're expecting out of him this season. I think Ty Hamilton is just very consistent at what he does, and that's what separates him from Talik Williams. Talik Williams is upside, and when he flashes, it's wow. I mean, Penn State game. I mean, he had plenty of flashes his freshman year, but for every one of those moments, there's a bunch of moments where it's like, where's this dude at even on the field? And even he'll say that. The coaches will say that consistency has always been an issue with you. And I don't know if you, you – that's – defensive line, interior defensive line is not the place to be so roller coaster, coastery with your production. All right, let's go to pick 10 and Steven. I cannot believe I have not taken a wide receiver yet. This is um very undisciplined. Um, I'm going to say Julian Fleming. I just – I can't give him all three of the starting wide receivers. Plus, he's – there's, it still feels like there's a there's a level Julian Fleming can get to if he's ever 88% healthy. And I think we saw that to an extent against Georgia. 
And if he can be that more consistently, I think he's a he's more than just like the third fiddle, third wheel to what Mecca Abuka and Marvin Harrison Jr. are. And but Brian Hartline is really high on him because the athletic profile is there. If it's ever he's never going to be hundred percent healthy here. That's just the Julian Fleming experience. But if he's ever like eighty five percent healthy, I think that's a really good college football player, maybe even like a third or uh, lower, low second round draft pick. And you think right now, again, Fleming compared to Jaden Ballard, Xavier Johnson, Carnell Tate, who would be next up as the next receiver picked, you feel like there's a sizable, a pretty sizable gap there right now, right? Yeah, just because it's it's more than, I mean, with some of those guys, it's like they're, it feels like they're one trick ponies or they're just young and haven't really shown enough yet to where you can believe in it fully, or their former walk-ons who also are the best player on the team. But yeah, it just feels like you need some, something reliable, and Julian Fleming has at least been reliable to a certain extent that you're not sure about everybody else yet. All right, let's go to pick 12. Nathan, what you doing? Uh, speaking of putting respect on people's names, you know, we saw the impact in the playoff game when Kate Stover couldn't play. I thought it was a palpable impact, a palpable absence. And rather than trying to figure out who else would make a, a good, the best uh, next tight end, I'll just take the best tight end that they have in Kate Stover. I cannot believe he lasted this long. I thought you were going to, and I thought you should have, Nathan, made him your third pick. After your first two picks were the top two receivers, I thought it's like go Stover and lock it up. If we're talking gap if we're talking gap, mm -hmm. I think this is a miss that he lasts till 12. I think I could make an argument over everybody out. Other than the top four, I had Cade Stover third on my list in terms of, like, great player in gap. My list was Marvin, JT, Stover, Donovan Jackson. Four guys who I thought were very good players, and there was a significant gap between how good they were and the next guy at their position was. And so I think in a world where, like, Mike Hall and Tommy Eichenberg and Lathan Ransom and Ty Hamilton are being picked, I would much rather have Cade Stover than any of those guys, Nathan. How did he last this long? Well, it, I mean, it is a tight end in Ohio State's offense. That's yeah. part of it, I suppose. <laughs> I think you could, though. I think you could argue I, putting him above JT on that list that you just made. If you're talking about gap, like proven gap, I mean – I think you can make that argument. So I, I might agree with you that, and I thought about him a couple rounds ago and I was, you know, Hey, this is part of the game. Like we're trying to, we're trying to read thoughts here over, over the zoom and, and get in each other's heads. And I took a gamble. He might still be here. And here he is on team Baird. I didn't want to say anything. I was like trying to decide, should I, is it good podcasting? If I say, Oh, there's a guy, I can't believe he's still out there. Steven, why did you not pick him earlier? He was going to be my next pick if he was still there. Oh, okay. I didn't, so you and, guys, but, oh, but, you're both waiting even, 12 and 13. I get it, you genius. Yeah. I, I Honestly, I, I kind of reached a point with him where it's like there's a gap there. So maybe I'll take some other guys first and hope he's still there. But if he's not, then this is where I can really, like, just have full faith in a guy who has proven absolutely nothing and has been here Steven's for playing four months. Receivers. Steven's playing four months. That's the other thing I was about, exactly was about to say. Like, yeah, he says Steven's like, taking a tight end. Yeah. It's 10 personnel. over or none. Yeah, 10 personnel. Or Steven's taking Jelani Thurman with the next pick, and it's like he's just rolling the dice. Like, I'm taking all, oh, yeah. all the guys, the young guys. He's taking Carnell Tate. He's taking Jelani Thurman. Mm -hmm. He's taking Jermaine Matthews, and he's just going to roll with the young guys and see how the voters vote. Okay. That takes us through 12 picks when we come back. Pick 13 in our Buckeye draft on Buckeye Talk. All right. 12 picks in. There are five on offense and seven on defense, which is also telling us a little something. No quarterback yet. Only one offensive lineman so far. So given the fact that, you know, there hasn't been a, a clear winner in the quarterback competition yet. I'm curious to see how you guys handle that. And it feels like with Donovan Jackson off the board, like maybe no one's going to pick an offensive lineman until the 30s and just be like, I don't know what you're supposed to do here. Like, which again would be a bad sign for Ohio State. It's like, hey, what happened? What? Steve, Steven's going to play Kojo Antwi at right guard. It's like, hey, 
<laughs> Listen, man, he's just trying to get some talent out there. So you never know what's going to happen. And Stephen Means, pick 13 is yours. Yeah, I'm still not going to pick any offensive linemen. Um, if it's not, <laughs> it's not would be a bad thing. It is a very bad thing. We've been saying it for two years. Um, I just want to be able to pick my corners. So I'm going to take Denzel Burke with the first pick. For Well, the first corner pick here. Plus, I just think, you know, he's one of the best players on the team when he's healthy. And he's got to be the first corner, right? Yeah. As much as there are other guys to like Steven, like there's no doubt that Burke's the first corner to draft like this. Yeah, I think last year, if you wanted to make a case for, hmm, maybe one of these two top 100 guys who's been in the program for a year, maybe they just might pass Denzel Burke. That makes more sense. You can't do that three years into the program when Denzel Burke was good as a freshman, Heard all as a sophomore, but then as soon as he got healthy, that Georgia game, he was very good, and we've heard a lot of good things about Denzel Burke these last two months here. Yeah, it seems like he really has found something this spring or refound it maybe, and, and the coaches are very enthused about that. So that's three players in the secondary for Steven, none yet for Nathan. Nathan, where are you going with pick 14? I kind of like uh, the secondary depth. I was thinking about taking Denzel Burke actually with my last pick, but I think I made the right choice. Um, I am going to instead uh, double up on the starting linebackers, and I'll take Steel Chambers. So this is uh, an area of is there a fun young guy you'd rather take? Cody Simon has also gotten a lot of run this spring while Tommy Eichenberg has been out. But Steel Chambers is hurt now, Nathan, but he's looked good before he got hurt when we saw him, right? And yeah. he was the starting Will linebacker last year and is on track to be the starting Will linebacker this year. Yeah, I mean, and he's been the, the primary – Will with the ones. Now, Simon has played a lot this spring, but it's mostly been at Mike because that's where Eichenberg has been out until Chambers got hurt. But we've also seen, as you would, I think, expect from a fifth year senior and a guy who's got his level of athleticism, you hear his name a lot at practice. He's, he's had a good spring until he got hurt. So, you know, hopefully not a long term thing for Ohio State. Uh, they don't seem to think it will be. And I think it's going to be tough for as good as Gabe Powers and CJ Hicks are. Uh, I, I've always thought neither neither of those neither Eichenberg or him were gonna make it easy for somebody to get up there and take snaps, especially when you consider that Cody Simon's definitely gonna be taking some. Nine five defense offense right now. Nine five. If we're trying to wonder where the strength of this team is. And again, that's not only strategy here, but also we're telling you something about who the best players are. Steven, pick fifteen to you. That is interesting. I did not think that's how that would shape out just given what this program is at this point. Okay, let's have a brief discussion here. Is this good or bad, Stephen? I think it's I think it's good. I, I think, think it's more good than bad. I think it's more good yeah, than bad. Because especially since a lot of the, the reason why it's so it's like this is so centered around one position. Like, are we worried about running back, wide receiver, or quarterback? Not really. I mean we're worried about offensive line, sure. But the fact that we're this confident with defense right now for a team whose defense has not really been up to par the way it should be consistently in four years, I think that's a good sign for where things are headed this season. I, I think it may be good, and it, it also comes with me probably stretching a little bit to take Ty Hamilton for that ninth one. But it's also – it. it Stephen makes a good point that, especially right now at quarterback and running back, I think we think – those positions will probably be fine, or there isn't a lot of separation between one and two, maybe even three or four at running back, depending on things we've actually seen. Uh, the only thing is it, it's not good if our hesitance to take offensive linemen turns into the offensive line being a real problem this fall. Mm -hmm. that, that is also true. There are lots of defensive players that you feel good taking. That, I think, is the bottom line. You're not gritting your teeth to be like, oh, I guess Lathan Ransom. It's like, no, I want to take Lathan Ransom. No, I, I want to take Steel Chambers. I think he's a good football player. That, acknowledging the depth on the offensive side at some positions and the lack of depth at some other positions offensively, in the end, Stephen, I think that there are more, probably two or three handfuls of defensive players you can just feel good about having on your team. I, I do think it's a good sign. So where are you going here at pick 15, Stephen? With that said I – I know we think that I think you can probably lump these running backs all together, but 
and I'm really very much thinking about using him to drive the bus for him this year. I'm going to take Travion Henderson here because the upside, if he's back to that, is no doubt creates a separation between him and whoever else in that room is. Whether it's Mayan Williams, Dallin Hayden, Chip Trainum, Evan Pryor. When he, if everybody is the best version of themselves, I think there is a gap between Trayvon Henderson and everybody else. Like at the end of and last season, we were we came into last year thinking that he was a Heisman Trophy candidate and one of the best running backs in the country, along with like B. John Robinson and Braylon Allen. And then he spent the whole year hurt. That might have been a heat. And check if we were doing this, <laughs> if we were doing this a year ago, he would have been much higher than this. Yeah. Both based on how good he was as a freshman and based on the uncertainty, or at least for me, around what you thought Mayan Williams was. So Mayan rose, Trey got hurt and came, you know, at least from the perception, came down a little bit. So that gap got a lot smaller. But what you're saying here, Stephen, with a pick 15 in a draft like this, upside of a guy, there's probably not many other guys left in this draft who have the proven upside of Travion Henderson. So I, th- I think this is a reasonable pick here. So you think we're a little hot? On Trey last year, Nathan might have gotten a little been. loose in the turn on that. Yeah. I do. Th- I think like the whole net, like that was kind of the perception nationally. It's like it's Bijan, and then like you know the next group, Trey Van Henderson's in that next group. I I, mm-hmm. I, I don't think we were on it because like we were Ohio State writers. I think it was kind of like a, a view based on twelve fifty no. as a freshman and what this offense was. That's kind of where we were. But then again, I again I think injuries. But I think yes, in the end, we were a little hot. Yeah, it's and I, I I find myself like caught on both sides of the argument on him. It's like, yeah, he had those yards as a freshman, but a bunch of them came in one game against uh you know Tulsa. But also, not everybody runs for two hundred fifty yards against Tulsa or whatever. So it's like, I, I he just needs to go do it, and I think he'd be the first one to say it. Nathan, pick sixteen to you. All right. Well, listen. There's only one other returning offensive lineman. And it's a guy who really was a starter even the year before that. It was starter quality and played an important role. And uh, on top of that, you know, he even has some flexibility position-wise. So I'll take Matt Jones right here. Yeah, it's getting a little, it's going to get a little hairy in the offensive line here coming up. So uh, he's a, I think we know what he is. He's a, he's a good football player. He's a he's a starting caliber Big Ten offensive lineman. Not all Big Ten, but Big Ten. So I think, you know, 16 picks into this draft. I think that's the range that we're in. So, Steven, pick 17 to you. I'm thinking Carson Tinsman. That's the only other offensive lineman I have any sure. Well, here we about. go. So here comes the offensive line run. And we are going to learn a few things here. But I do think, Stephen, right? I mean, if we're talking about pecking order of offensive linemen in general, I think Hinsman's third. I uh, Right? Did you have much hesitation here, Stephen, with that? Zero. I mean, we talked to Ryan Day on Wednesday, and coming out of that, that's the only other offensive lineman that we can pencil in with a starting job right now. Is that what would you think he's the he's the definite third guy, third offensive lineman in something like this, Nathan? No, I mean he hasn't declared Hensman the starter there. You know they stopped short of that at that pointedly, um, and I I I'll just go ahead and make my next pick, and we can have this conversation. I'll take Josh Fryer because I mean Josh Fryer was the next best offensive lineman last year. Josh Fryer was a the guy they turned to to start um, at right tackle for Dewan Jones. He more or less played starter snaps when uh, when Matt Jones missed a game and um, against Michigan. Even though Enoch Vamahi got the start, Fryer kind of had the bigger role there. And I still think he might be their next best offensive lineman. He's just not a center, um, and is, or at least is a, more of a tackle than the, the other people that they have to consider. So I don't know whether he'll be the starter at left tackle. Um, maybe they decide he needs to go back to right tackle and they put somebody else at left tackle. I don't know what's going to happen, but I think Josh Fryer is a starter on his offensive line it, this fall. I just think the position is still a little bit up in the air. Um, I think Carson Hensman may end up starting at center too. I just don't know that it's clear cut between those two who the next best guy is. Uh, it just doesn't sound like 
Vic Cutler's like in the thick of the fight right now. He's yeah. transferred from a small school at center that Hinsman's just and again, and there's Jacob still James always heard. the option. You can move Matthew Jones to center and play Yanakamahi at guard, and you could figure that out. We've seen him move guys around before. I would take Hinsman third in the pecking order of offensive linemen here. I would take Fryer fourth. So I think these are the four right guys off the board at this point. And even though there's not a ton of certainty with them, there's certain more certainty with them than there are with the guys who are left right now. So Stephen will take pick 19 to you. Okay, let's get back to having some fun with this. Um Said the guy who took an offensive lineman number one overall. You should be, you're like, offensive line time, baby. Let's do it. See, you're no longer receiver guy. You're offensive <laughs> line guy now. Steve was like, let's get back to some fun. Come on down, Enoch Vamahi. Let's do this. Steven Means style. What's up, George Fitzpatrick? You're on Team Means. Come on, Luke Montgomery. We're playing you at linebacker. We're, we're, Luke Montgomery, you can staple his brother to him. Then you could have your quarterback, Ryan Montgomery, be the quarterback. Well, Lava, stapling's just part of these drafts now. <laughs> Steven Means, offensive line guy. Maybe I should do that because then it gives, like, Luke some extra juice to want to yeah. block better. It's like I'm also then protecting you can tell him, my man. little you brother. Luke Montgomery. You took him. Luke, I took you. If you just walk up to him with a spring game and be like, Luke, I took you 19th and I stapled your, his brother, your brother to you. He's like, hey, Luke, I took you 19th, and I stapled your brother to you. Just say that to Luke Montgomery and see if he thinks you're uh, looped. All right. His, fir- well, his, first, his first reaction would be, why did you take me 19th? I'm a freshman. And then his second reaction would be, get away from me now. I no longer ever want to talk to you. But I'm going to finish this out. This is why we do need to get an NIL deal so we can have a current player on the team in with this draft. That's if I agree. We had, you know. Jake Seibert drafting a third team here. That's where that's where it would be at. Okay, go ahead, Steve. That would be that would be uncomfortable though. You can't draft your teammates because that actually Luke Montgomery would come up to Jake Seibert in the locker room and be like, "Dude, sixty oh, yeah. third. You took me sixty third. What are we doing here?" Okay, Stephen, who are you taking? I'm gonna take. I'll take you. No, never mind. Never mind. I'm going to play it safe. I'll take Cameron Martinez as my nickel. Finish all the safeties. So that's all the safeties for you. I think that's a good pick. Um, you know, I think they, they were saying like, like, they like Jihad Carter this spring before mm-hmm. he got hurt. But I think, you know, Cam Martinez is, is running with the ones. So in that nickel slot safety spot, I think uh, I think that's a good pick with pick number 19. All right, Nathan, 20 to you. Um, 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 um. So I think I'm I, – I, I like that pick too. I, I just think we've talked all, all spring about how you can maybe just flip the safeties. Um, so I was prepared to just to do that if need, need be, make the second string my starters. Um. I'm going to stay on the offensive line, I think, and take somebody that I'm just really intrigued by and someone who also has some um, versatility. I'll take Tegra Shibola here. And I'll decide exactly where I put him as this thing plays out. I think that's right. I think he should be the fifth guy off right now. That's not based on a huge difference between Zen Mahalski that we would see. But if, you know... Hand to the fire, who would I say is going to be the right tackle right now? I think I'd say Tegra Shibola. So then that means we've drafted the five presumed starting offensive linemen, although clearly Tegra Shibola and Zen Mahalski are still in that battle at right tackle. But as Ryan Day said, nobody has stepped up and, and seized that job at the moment. So that is three spots on the offensive line for Nathan, two for Steven, and that brings us to pick 21 for you, Steven. I don't know if I agree with that. I don't. You don't. Zinmo, you, you think it might not be? You think it might be Maholski over Shibola? I think it might be Maholski over Shibola because there's a Maholski hasn't been 100 percent healthy this this spring. So that not saying that like oh if he's 100 percent healthy he's Paris Johnson, but if you're not 100 percent healthy plus you're doing something new for the first time, plus you know the development process, all that together can probably play a role in why things have looked that as bad as they have for Zen sometimes. So if he's healthier when we get to fall camp, plus the normal progression, while with Tegra, there seems to be like just the way he was talking, 
there's he's as aggressive as Paris Johnson is as a blocker, but he's not as talented as Paris Johnson is as a blocker. So when he's aggressive and he misses, it looks it's it's a wolf almost. So I'll I'll take Zen Maholski here. I think there I think there's there's a little bit of um Brandon Bowen there to me, where it's a lower rated guy who at right tackle might find a little niche there. So Mahoski's a year older, right? And that depends, you know, a lot of yeah. this stuff is like, well, do you want, you know, Tegra's a higher ranked recruit. He's a year younger. Does that mean he's a younger guy on the rise or mahalski has been around a little bit more, you know, he's more of a late in the process guy, but they liked him. So um, it probably makes sense for them to go back to back because they are battling for that job and will continue to do so. Nathan pick 22. I guess I better take someone for the secondary just to be safe. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you think? I I, uh, I think so. So Jordan Hancock has run with the ones all spring. We we did at one point theorize whether that means uh, do the the returning guys get some deference early in camp? Um, and I think Davis and Igbenosan is is legit and is going to be that may just be a three man thing. And they like Jerry Brown too, but Hancock was supposed to maybe be a starter last year. Injuries got in the way, so I'm going to give the benefit of the doubt to him and take him as my first corner. I think he should be the second corner taken, as he is being here, and I think he probably should have gone earlier. I, th- I think there's – he has not played bad. He just hasn't played because he was hurt last year. He basically won a starting job in August and then didn't get to play. So now he's back, and he's running with the ones, and over the course of last fall, all we did was bit by bit by bit learn – how much more they liked him, how much more they were thinking of relying on him than we realized. And by the end of the year, it was like, well, yeah, we lost the starter in Jordan Hancock. It's like, what? So it's possible that he just helps as as much as like Denzel Burke getting back to it. Like Jordan Hancock showing us something that health has prevented him from showing could rectify the corner spot in a nanosecond. So I think this is very good value here at pick 22. And Stephen, where are you going at 23? I'll take Igbenos, and I was going to let Nathan decide which one of those two I took. And I think they legitimately have three guys they can rotate through two spots, the way they've talked about them and what we've seen. And it's interesting because all three of them are very different types of corners. You know, Jordan Hancock is, you know, he's longer. He's six one. He's what you what you typically see in the Ohio State corners, the six one one ninety. You know, Davis Igbenos is the more physical dude. He's just a bigger presence. While Denzel Burks may be smaller, but makes up for it with how scrappy he is. Um, I just think they've got three guys that they can really rely on there, and Igmanosin just gives them something that they really haven't had just from a physical standpoint since Jeff, and really maybe have only had with Jeff, someone that big and that physical at corner. Yeah, I think those those are all those are three picks from strength at corner. So again, the the idea of like, well, Hancock or Igmanosin could go either way. I'm happy with either of them. That's from strength. That's not from, I don't know, who cares? That's no, I think they're both good. So uh, again, I think it makes sense. They go back to back here. Pick 24 to you, Nathan. Well, I'm trying to figure out where I think there's like a big separation still in this position is there's not a big separation or there's places where Steven or I only need one more guy and, and the other one's plugged up. So I'll take my pick of the quarterbacks and I'll take Common Court. Just to so keep tell the Marvison thought... Harrison the, the Marvison Harvison Juniorson connection. Yeah. And and also like we've said all along that like there are reasons to think that he came in with if not a not a, certainly not an insurmountable lead, but that you know, Devin Brown was the one who had to prove he was better than Common Court in some ways, in a way that maybe Common Court didn't have to prove. So uh but also, we've also seen some things this spring when there has been some separation there. At times, Kyle McCord was the guy, especially in that first scrimmage, that kind of took the seized the moment at the end of that first scrimmage. I think you anybody could say, I think there's separation at quarterback. I understand they haven't picked a starter. I think Kyle McCord so far is the better guy. He's a year older. I think he knows the offense better. I think there's a gap here. I'm taking Kyle McCord in the top ten in a draft like this. Nathan, like, could someone view it that way, do you think? I think so. I think so. It, it, we're, we're probably somewhat influenced here by the fact that that Day is saying, well, I haven't seen someone really step up and claim it. He may have 
also two different visions in his mind of what that means. Because right now, like if that's true, what you're saying, it's like, well, maybe Common Core does have a lead, but then that means he's expecting to see one thing from Common Core that isn't necessarily the same thing he's expecting to see from Devin Brown. I don't know. And I think it, it, other people I've talked to say that this is close. So, or that they've heard it's very, very close still right now. But there are also indications that if they had to pick somebody to, to start today, it'd be Common Core. Steven, how are you viewing this quarterback thing? Were you just going to let Nathan pick it and you almost don't care because you think they're so close? Or were you thinking, I, well, I do have a, I do have a guy who I would want to take, but I'm just going to wait. How did you think about it? No, I think we were entering the range where you probably needed to pull the trigger on your guy. I probably would have taken Colin McCourt first too, but it does feel close or than in years past enough that even if you want one guy, you don't feel like you're settling with the other guy. You can put Devin Brown on your team and run your offense and get people to yeah. play your team, and no one's going to be sitting like, oh, my God, I can't believe that is that quarter. Yeah. Like, nothing's Are missing. Take Tristan. No, nothing's can I ask cute. a question? Mm-hmm. This came up on Wednesday at the interview session. Excuse my ignorance. Gebbia or Jebbia? I thought it was Guh, Gebbia. Yeah, I thought it was Gebbia. Is it like a GIF or GIF conversation that it just depends on the person? Because our dear friend Tim May called him Jebbia, and they called him Jebbia twice. And sometimes when Tim does stuff, it's like Tim learned that. Like It's like, I, I just got off the yeah. phone with uh, Mr. Jebbia, and he was yeah. telling me it's a soft G. And all of a sudden, like Tim's like Jebbia his way through the news conference and i was like well i've been saying that wrong yeah but he was also calling don't have i i was calling a mecca mika for the longest too though so i actually just looked up if you look up tristan his name pronunciation it says sounds like jebbia where does it say that on google No, but I mean, like, in the great big Google machine of the world, or did, like, an Ohio State media guide pronunciation thing come up? So uh, I, I'm seeing other places here, too. Um, the Omaha World Herald had a story about him, and it says pronounced Jibia. He was a a, a um, Nebraska commit at one point. Um, another Nebraska – he was actually he was at Nebraska. He plays for Syria. He started in Nebraska. And their media guide says Jebbia also. So I guess that is – Look at that. Look at that. Oregon Live, Jebbia. Look at that. So, here we have it. So Tim, 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 Tim got a little scoop. He scooped mm-hmm. us, and then he dropped his scoop all over the news conference. I don't even know why I was asking about him. Tim literally asked a Tristan Jebby a question at the end of the news conference just to pronounce his name correctly twice in public, just to get credit on this podcast. Tristan Jebbia. Steven, he's out there for you to take. Do you want to take him right now? A pick 25, just merch you down for Jebbia? I will not be doing that. Now that you that. know. I was not oh, okay. doing that. Who do you want to take at 25 then? He can coach if he wants. He can, you know, serve as a yeah, he can coach. That's he what is. He's doing Brian anyway. Day says he goes to anyway. the staff meetings. Yeah, he's doing it anyway. He goes so. to the staff meetings. It's fascinating. Yeah. I mean, it Listen, really is an interesting way of doing business here. If you're going to start four receivers, why not start two quarterbacks and just come up with something really off the wall? I mean, there's a two quarterback offense out there that I think that a high school was running like it, it, I still think that's coming. I actually do think that's the next – I think it might be the last evolution of offensive football, but is literally two quarterbacks, both of whom can throw, both of whom can run. And you don't know, like, one guy takes the snap, but he can, like, toss it to the other guy who then might throw. I think there's an evolution out there for that. And I don't know when we'll get to it on a high level of play, like at the college level, but I, I – maybe not in my lifetime. I think it's out there. But it's not this podcast to squeeze it in a moment that minute fifty four in between picks twenty four and twenty five of the draft, and then you guys could pick two quarterbacks. Actually, you can do it right now, Nathan. If you also want to pick Devin Brown and introduce the two quarterback offense to Power Five football today, right now here, I'm going to let you do that, and then you can just not have like another guard or whatever. I don't care. So that's on the board. But Stephen, the pick is to you at twenty five. So before we continue with this draft, I probably should ask this in the beginning, but. You know, we play on pods during the pod anyway. Am I allowed to take guys of of the people? Who, do they have to already be enrolled in school? So you can't take Brandon Ennis. I think that is 
correct because the idea is that it's a spring game draft, okay. but just assuming that everybody here is healthy. And I know okay. Brandon Ennis was up here hanging around, like if a month, but you couldn't play him Saturday. So I'm okay, okay. healing people magically. Okay. I am not okay enrolling them. But okay. good idea. Good staple attempt. You almost <laughs> won yourself a stapler, Mr. Means. <laughs> Brandon Ennis stapled to Xavier Johnson is the pick for Stephen Means, but we're not going to let you do it. It's literally what I was going to do here. Then I'm going <laughs> to take, take Xavier Johnson here. Oh, you got the best player on the team. Congratulations. Yeah. That's a good pick. Yeah. And honestly, so it actually hurt. is a good pick. He's their second best slot receiver at this point. So, yeah. And you, I mean, you move him into the backfield a little bit. If Trey comes up saying. a little gimpy, you're all good here. I mean, like I, I'm so far come so far around on Xavier Johnson. I'm back around the other side. I've done like a full rotation of the earth on Xavier Johnson. So he's hurt also. Like we just showed up one day and Steel Chambers was hurt and Xavier Johnson was hurt. So you're not going to mm -hmm. see him on Saturday. But you know what he can do, which is everything. He can run, he can catch, he can tackle on special teams, and I think if they played him at middle linebacker, he'd probably be okay at that. So with the 25th pick, Stephen Means takes the ultimate Buckeye X. Nathan, pick 26 to you. So it's funny because my next pick was going to be Jaden Ballard, and I was going to take him over Xavier Johnson, even though that, that kind of counteracts what I was saying earlier about just best pound-for-pound -pound football player. But having already taken Harrison and Ibuka, I thought maybe just Ballard would fit as a more natural Z on the other side over there. Um, and I've been the one who has maybe been encouraging people to pump the brakes a little bit on the, how much does Jaden Ballard break through this year? How much does he get some kind of big role? But just in terms of what he is as a football player, I think it fits well here and um, I'll, I'll gladly take him. So if Julian Fleming couldn't play in the opener, Let's say he gets abducted by aliens the day before the opener in September. Who do we think would get more snaps in that game? Xavier Johnson or Jaden Ballard? And we'll hold off on the Carnell Tate, like young guy discussion at the moment. But Nathan, like that, because you can move guys around, like you can move a Mecca to solve problems. You can move a Mecca outside and play Xavier in the slot. And mm -hmm. those are your three guys. You could keep a Mecca in the slot, play Jaden outside. And there you go. Who do you think would play more, Nathan? Well, this happened last year in the opener, yep. and Xavier Johnson got those snaps. Now, it's another year of development for, for Jane Ballard, and people are saying good things about him. But I think the answer is probably Xavier Johnson. The answer might also be they play more 12 personnel than they would in another situation. It happened again in Steven? Xavier Johnson because it also happened at the end of the season in the Georgia game. When Marvin got hurt, it was Julian, Ameka, and Xavier out there. But the question is – how much do we think Jaden Ballard has changed his fortunes as he's developed and come along? Although Brian Hartline also said he kind of wishes he was six months further along than he is. I don't know. It's like the progression. We know that Jaden Ballard, I think, wasn't ready last year. Yeah. But this always felt like a two-year apprenticeship for Jaden Ballard. And yeah. then we'll see in year three. And now we're coming up on year three. So the question is, how much different would it be a year ago? There was no – I mean, last – you know, Brian Hartline said, the guys I trust, Xavier Johnson's on that list before the season started last year. Jaden Ballard wasn't yet on that list. But now you're both saying it still would be X. It hasn't changed enough that Ballard would be in ahead of him, Nathan. I think that they still lean security, even with all the talent that's on this roster. And I think it's true at most positions. You still see coaches, position coaches, leaning security. Sometimes it's prudent. Sometimes it's maddening. Sometimes it's – sort of both at the same time, but I think they would lean Xavier. I think this one is an interesting case of that, though, because the thing Jaden Ballard is good at is so loud, right? I mean, that the way he he's so fast, and it's he's an, explo he's an explosive play away from doing from, – he's always going to be explosive, but it's so loud that sometimes it can overshadow the fact that he's probably still in the process of developing – the other 9,000 things you have to be able to do as a receiver because it is so loud. Like it's not, we're, we're so past the days though of like that being so valuable. Cause I mean, Harlan even said it when we were just having a conversation, I don't think they had a problem running go routes last year in a way that it, because of that, what Ballard brings to the table, even if it is loud and fun to look at, it loses its value. 
when it, you feel like Julian filming has shown you moments he can do it. And Matt Kambuka has shown you moments he can do it. I mean, they every like six play of the game for every single week was like a Marvin Harrison go route. Just go throw it up to Marvin. Let's see if he can catch it. And it worked every single time. So it feels like the other stuff as a receiver is still very much in development mode to where the talent is there. I just don't know as just like a, who's the best receivers. I'm not all the way confident that he's fifth yet. Okay. Steven, pick 27 to you. Let me finish out this defense here. I'll take Cody Simon first just because he's clearly the third linebacker at this point. And as much as CJ Hicks is shiny, but it's very obvious the pecking order of the linebackers right now. And Cody Simon is third here, and so I'll use him as my mic. Who can also play some guys are ex- You guys are exhibiting some self-control here because I think like – Carnell Tate over Jaden Ballard and CJ Hicks over Cody Simon are a couple of the things that when I was talking about earlier, it's like, uh, are people going to do that? Because it feels like, mm-hmm. and you guys both exhibiting some self-control here, not going that route. So Cody Simon pick 27 to Steven, Nathan 28 to you. Every time we do one of these drafts, I always think about halfway through or if it's over that we maybe should do them by position <laughs> because we get into this stage where there's a bunch of guys who I think yeah. I would draft higher based on just their talent. But if I'm trying to build this team and it's sort of a little competitive thing here, um, I guess I'm just going to have to s- keep trying to pick the better offensive lineman they're left. Cause that's where that's like the last head to head thing that Steven and I have. So I'll take Enoch Vamahi. Solid backup, has backed up a number of positions in his career. Um, just kind of like a, a a veteran of the twos and probably will be again this year unless they make a, a big-time shift of some kind between now and the start of the season. Um, a guy who, well, I think I've said, I think I've said what needs to be said. Enig Vamahi. I, th- I love how and- that was you trying to sell yourself on the pick as much as it was you trying to sell us <laughs> on it. Well, but, I mean, he's <laughs> definitely the... Th- I mean, you're picking him as the third guard. You have Matt Jones. Steven has Donovan Jackson. You both need a, another guard. Mm-hmm. And Enoch Vamahi, to our knowledge, Nathan, right now, would, is their third guard, right? I don't. Is there, we don't believe there's much debate about that? I, I believe that's correct as of today. Okay. So he goes 28th. Steven, 29 to you. Nathan doesn't need any tackles, so... No, that we are at that point where, yeah. you know, right. Stephen has safeties and defensive ends, doesn't need any of them, and Nathan needs all of them. And um, you know, Stephen needs to take a tight end and a receiver still, and Nathan's filled up there. So we are are really moving out of the head to head competition here, which will just sort of allow us to understand like who you guys think the best remaining football players yeah, are. That's why I like it. I'm taking Talik Williams here. Upside is there if he ever decides to lock in on it and consistently be there. So I I think we talked a lot a year ago at this time about like small sample size, Tyreek Williams, PFF was all over him. It's like, okay, he's played 180 snaps. Can we chill out? I thought they, there were some people who were expecting too much of him a year ago. And then Mike Hall kind of got past him. And it's not like that he's not a good football player, but we've seen that, heard that of like, the flashes are there. He needs to do it consistently, right? Are you in the shape that you can stay on the field? I think we might be all the way back around of like underrating him possibly at this point that actually he is a pretty darn good football player. He has not played a ton, but there might be more. This could be the jumpier, Nathan. I, I, I think there is absolutely a possibility. When we get to the bus podcast, there might be some people on the Tyreek Williams bus because I think he has a chance to pull it together and do what he has done at his best more consistently. Yeah, I still I look at him as like the, you know, the way that uh, Mike Hall is baby Aaron Donald, then Tyreek Williams is almost baby Mike Hall a little bit. Mm. Like he's he's had that sort of he's shown the pass rush, and it's been really interesting at times, but he hasn't necessarily shown it in the same capacity that Mike Hall has. And so maybe, but if he makes that kind of jump, I mean, what if he's just as good as Mike Hall was last year, this year? I mean that. Look how much better that rotation is now. If he like jumps up to that level, so um, I, I've been. I was the one who going into last year was again kind of on the hey, let's let's wait and see, and kind of then then separate from that, there was obviously the the building thing that Mike Hall had. We need to hear that. I think 
Isn't that like, wouldn't you say that? Like there's, we need to start hearing them talk about Tyreek Williams in a, in a, in a slightly different way where they're the ones pushing the, the narrative. It's not just things you see in, in second team stuff. I just want to hear a different message. I think with them, it's, it's been the same message. It's, he's really good. He just needs to get consistent. He's really good. He just needs to get in shape. We're three years into this and it's still the same same message with him while with the other three guys in his class, because we're talking about this 21 defensive line class, which was so impressive. Mike Hall's, his message is built on itself. Year one, it was like, yeah, he's just kind of in the background. Year two, it's like, he ain't no three. <laughs> J- JT to him a little while from day one, it was like, yeah, look how he's been really impressive for a dude who just got here two weeks ago. While with Jack Sawyer, it's just, they tried to make him play a position he probably shouldn't have been playing in the first place, and maybe he's back on track now. But those guys have progressed in how they've talked about him. Then while with Talik, it's just been the same thing. No, I think that's well said, and I, and I do think, right, we, we're not getting the cues from the way he's talked about yet, but maybe we will. All right, Nathan, pick 30 to you, then we'll take our last break. So there's actually one thing I could do with my offensive line here that if I appealed to the Marcus of Queensbury rule book, I think would, would be allowable, um, which is – Take another tackle, move Matt Jones to center, and but I think we need to just go to back to just drafting who the best players are here. So I'll just take the leftover center down the line and start drafting guys based on what the buzz is and, and what's going on. So this is where I'll take Kenyatta Jackson. Oh, yeah, no, this is good. Oh, I'm excited, Kenyatta Jackson. Caden Curry had a bigger role last year. But this yeah. is Kenyatta Jackson as the third defensive end off the board, Nathan. Did you have no hesitation about that? No, just again, based on – I think there's a chance that Kenyatta Jackson is this year's Mike Hall, a guy who came in in the summer, had a redshirt freshman year that um, that he needed in order to develop physically and in all other ways, but also probably kind of pissed him off a little bit. And I think he's unleashing a little bit of that this spring. And again, it's just the, who, who the buzz is building about. Like, you know, Ryan Day brought him up specifically on Wednesday as a guy who's done it this spring. And um, that was kind of – they weren't really necessarily talking about Mike Hall quite yet last spring. But by the time we got to preseason camp, that was a name you couldn't ignore. And I think that it's starting to happen a little bit with Kenyatta Jackson. I think I've got an even better comparison. I think he's – gearing up to have the type of sophomore second year that Jordan Hancock was robbed of because it's the same mm. scenario where like Caden Curry, Denzel Burke, they're ahead because they were here in the spring while Amari Abor, Kenyatta Jackson, JK Johnson, Jordan Hancock didn't show up to the summer. So it's like, just spend the year learning, man, learn where your locker is, learn how to be a college football player and come see me in the spring. And then in the spring, you started hearing a lot about Jordan Hancock. And then you got more of it in the fall. And then he got hurt. So he got robbed of it. Well, here we are again. We're, we're hearing and we're seeing a lot of Kenyatta Jackson. So knock on wood, he doesn't get abducted by aliens. He just might be on the track he's supposed to be on for a guy who didn't get here till June. Where's number 97? We are workshopping the bonus Bosa as a nickname for him. So watch for him. He will be out there on Saturday, and you will have a chance to see what we're talking about here. Let's take our last break. When we come back, picks 31 through 44 in our Ohio State spring football draft. We'll do it next on Buckeye Talk. All right, so we'll speed through the end of this here. Steven, we're to you with pick 31. I'll take C.J. Hicks first. Of the two guys that I'm going to end up, one office, one defense. I'll take CJ here first because he's, I think he's the fourth best linebacker. And you are an abduction, alien abduction away from being needed. And the upside is the upside. Any temptation for you, Stephen, to take him ahead of Cody Simon as the third linebacker off the board? Or was it like, no, I mean, you've got to take Cody with how much he's played? Yeah, it's just. The way the, the, the amount Cody has played and it being very clear, he's number three. I had to be responsible, but I think CJ Hicks is more talented than him. Yes. Two things could be true. Any inclination for you, Nathan? I mean, you have, you took the two linebackers already. I guess you could have decided on playing three linebackers and taking CJ Hicks again, very, you know, you guys were pretty chill about this, Nathan. Did you have any uh, CJ Hicks itches you might have scratched before this? I was, it was a situation where, I mean, I don't remember. I took, I took Chambers, what, like in the middle rounds. And mm-hmm. I didn't have a, a strategy necessarily going in, but 
But obviously, if you get left with a former top 10 prospect as your guy, yeah, that's a good position to be in. So uh, I still think it's defensible taking Chambers just because um, he's done it and he is doing it. And it's he didn't he didn't seem like a guy this spring before he got hurt who was just the veteran still at that spot. Like he was he's out there getting it done. I thought that was worth something. No, I think that's right. Hicks, 31. You took Chambers at 14. So CJ Hicks goes 31. Nathan, 32 to you. So sticking with buzzy guys, I'm going to take Jair Brown here. And I think at some point we may have to start thinking about this three-corner thing as a four-corner thing. A guy who has been recognized a couple times as a silver bullet of the day. A guy that they like his versatility. They've been playing him at nickel safety. Ryan Day brought that up again. <clears throat> excuse me, on Wednesday. So there's a path to the field for him. They, they like him a lot. They trust him. And uh, I, I think that for the long, first time in a long time, you can start picking guys off of the second row in the secondary and feeling pretty good about it. Just seems really smart and locked in for a second mm-hmm. year guy. And then Ryan Day was talking about his talent. Like he's, I think he's ready for this. Sometimes it's hard to be ready in year two. I think he is ready in year two. And I think the idea of, Nathan, what you're saying, do we just have to think about this as a four-corner group? But also we remain intrigued by the idea of the snaps he's getting at nickel safety. If they go to a dime look in some passing situations on third and long and they play a corner in the slot instead of a safety, it feels like he will be the guy, Stephen. So, like, there's a path to the field for him that maybe is beyond – Denzel Burke and Jordan Hancock getting abducted by aliens because he could actually carve out a, a 15 snap a game role. I think. I think him getting those nickel snaps or why, why I push back on the, the four cornerback thing, because if not, then I do think he's talented enough and good enough to push that forward. But it looks like they're carving out a legitimate role for him to be a slot corner in these third down passing situations enough to where it's not going to feel like, they're playing three cornerbacks and the other one just doesn't get snaps every single week. I think he's going to get a healthy amount of playing time this year. All right. So I think that's a good pick at pick 32, 33 to you, Stephen. I'm taking Carnell Tate. And I think I would have taken Carnell Tate over Jaden Ballard, even if Ballard was still on the board. I think he is a more, what's the word I'm looking for here? Well-rounded re- wide receiver. And I honestly think that that group of 2023 20, wide receivers is more well-rounded than anybody on the second unit right now. He's just the one who has started flashing and popping first. How far could he get this year, Stephen? Could, do you think Carnell Tate could play snaps that matter against good teams without any players ahead of him being out of the lineup? This I don't, season. Yeah, I don't think it gets that far. I think those top three, really, really those top three, because, I mean, they might need Xavier Johnson to play left tackle at some point. That that top three is very set. And it's like the least of Brian Hartline's worries this year. But I do think he can get as high as number four in a world yeah, where you just might need, you just might need Xavier Johnson to do other stuff for you, depending on how some other stuff works out. And you just need a dude to be at receiver for you. And it's going to be Carnell Tate. He's not less blocked than Jackson Smith. The Jigba was in 2020 or, yes. or, or Marvin Harrison jr. Was in 2021. Um, now, if he's better than both of those guys, then we we're, we have something to talk about. I just think that's a lot to put on him right now. And maybe he is. Maybe year two, Carnell Tate is very similar to year two, Jackson Smith, the Jake Moore, or year two, Marvin Harrison Jr. But it's just the way that room is set up right now. You just got to wait in year one because the dudes you're sitting behind are first round draft picks. Yeah. Year one, Jackson Smith and Jigba had the toe tap in the back of the end zone. And year one, Marvin Harrison Jr. had the Rose Bowl. And that was it. The rest of the time, they didn't really have anything. So mm-hmm. Carnell Tate might not have more than a really good player to here uh, in year one for him. Pick 34 to you, Nathan. I'm going to update my list to try to make, make sure I remember who Steven has taken. Um, I'll take Caden Curry. I need another defensive end. And he hasn't been as buzzy this spring. 
that's been, you know, Kenyatta Jackson has taken a lot of oxygen in that room as far as the, the young buzz. But we saw Caden Curry do it last year. And he, again, the guys looked just like a, a football player last year. And um, there may be some comparison to be made with the, the way Tyleek Williams jumped out that, that true freshman year. Um, so there's a little bit on Curry to, you know, when he when he's now in more of a first string rotation, if that phrase makes sense, that does, is he doing it against, you know, first string offenses, but they liked a lot. They were, they were talking about him last year. They like a lot of what he did and you could see it, uh, both on defense and special teams. The guy was just making plays. No, I think that's right. Fourth defensive end off the board, certainly some upside there and, and had some nice production as a freshman. So that's a good pick. Pick 35 to you, Steven. I'm going to take Hero Canoe. Just I'll take that upside over Jaden McKenzie right now, even if right now he's probably working with the threes. I think this is a guy who, I mean, they're going to need him to work. They're going to need, they just need depth at defensive tackle. So I'll take Hero Canoe. So it's tackle. pretty obvious who the top three defensive tackles are with Mike yeah. Hall. Ty Hamilton and Tyleek Williams. But this fourth spot, Stephen, right? It is there for the taking for a young guy like Canoe who has been buzzy at times because they need it, right? They yeah. they love to rotate up to six at defensive tackle. They certainly, at the very least, need to find number four here. And the options right now, maybe they search in the portal. I don't take Booker. He just. Uh, uh, as we're recording this, he announced he's head to Arkansas, so that's off the table there. But uh, maybe Jaden McKenzie has like a Robert Landers, uh, Davon Hamilton type, you know, fifth year where it's like finally clicks for him. Or it's right now it's Hero Canoe who in year two can do what Tommy Tohi I did in his year two, 2019, and insert himself into this rotation. Or maybe it's a transfer portal guy, but I'll bank on Hero Canoe right now on that upside just based on what the options are. All right, pick 36 to you, Nathan. Who? Well, I need some safeties. Um, and by some, you mean all. I mean, three yeah. safeties. <laughs> Unless I want to take a third linebacker, which is actually intriguing. But let's let's keep it to um, let's keep it in the realm of, of, of trying to make this team look like what a Ohio State team is going to look like. I'm going to take Jihad Carter. And for me, it's a guy who has been a, a starter and a good player at Syracuse, a guy that I think they were disappointed to lose, and a guy whose versatility, um, I think I would probably slot him in at nickel right now based on what we know about um, who's left on the board, frankly. But a guy that I think could see the field at a couple of safety spots for Ohio State, depending on what they need and, and how other things are mixing up at any given time. Has to get back healthy, but that could still be an August competition there with Cam Martinez. By the way, uh, Steven in the house with his defense. Steven has drafted all 11 defensive players that he needs. So just finishing up on the offensive side of the ball, like we always say about Steven Means, he loves offensive linemen and defense. That's just mm -hmm. what he's about as a football writer. So that's mm -hmm. what he's doing in this draft. Pick 37 to you, Steven. Well, yeah, you know, my wide receivers are locked up too, so – I just don't want to deal with the offensive line picks right now because it's, it's stressing me out every time I look at this roster here. And, like, it's really Welcome to Ryan out. Day and Justin Fry's life right now. <laughs> yeah, man. Little, little window into that. <laughs> Darn you, Greg Stradrawa. Darn you. So I just feel like I'm fun right now. I'm taking Jelani Thurman. Okay, let's do it. So yeah. this is a, a freshman tight end over G. Scott over Joy Royer, Joe Royer, and this is just having a good time. And when we talked to Ryan Day on Wednesday, Stephen, there were a number of Jelani Thurman questions, and most of Ryan Day's answers felt like, okay, guys, come on, come yeah. on, come on. Yep. But that's okay, Stephen's taking – you're taking him anyway. Yes, I'm taking him anyway. It's. I think Jelani Thurman has entered the range of – from the coaching coaching staff perspective, please stop talking about the freshman. We know he's good, but please stop asking us about the freshman. Stop doing it. They're not going to talk good about Jelani Thurman anymore, which I love it because it means he's really good. 
I get it. It's this is a G in real life. This is a G Scott Joe Royer thing. Can those guys be good enough to let them play twelve personnel and thirteen personnel? But that's boring. I don't want to talk about the former top one hundred wide receiver who's transitioning to tight end, and I don't want to talk about the tight end who played wide receiver in high school and just needed some physical development. I want to talk about the top one hundred tight end who, because Cade Stover caught all those passes last year, has me thinking about all the possibilities about throwing the ball to tight end in two years. Yeah, and if we're making babies uh, on Buckeye Talk, uh, uh, <laughs> Nathan, as the person who most recently made a baby among the people yeah. on this show, is giving a very big frown to that. Uh, baby Darnell Washington is is where I am with Johnny Thurman and just like the size and the potential there. So, Nathan, what did you think of the way that Ryan Day was sort of batting away Jelani Thurman questions this week? No, I think you guys have the right read on that, that it's the the the, the – the flame was getting a little hot there, I think, for them. They want him to be a guy, and especially because I think they know, and and I, I completely defend Steven making this pick because it's a little bit on Joe Royer and G. Scott at this late in their careers to now go mm-hmm. out and prove why that was a foolish pick. Because right now, you would say, well, I don't know who to pick between those two guys who are the clear number two, some one of them, which one, I don't know. So I'm going to take the fun guy. I'm going to take the guy that, that sells tickets or whatever. I'm going to, if I don't know which of those two guys will help me win a game, I'm going to take the guy who's going to help me win a fan vote. And that's Jelani Thurman because people are super excited right now. And I think for good reason, but I would, I would caution as Ryan day is, it's just really hard. True freshman tight ends, especially when you've already yeah. got a really good one. Who's going to take a lot of, a lot of snaps. I don't know if it's, if, if there's going to be a lot of opportunity for him, but I think I think you should be excited for 2024, 2025. Just maybe don't put a lot of expectations on 2023. The real problem is how they use him, how how Ohio State uses tight ends. Because I don't know if he decided to stay home and go to Georgia, then I think I'd be like, turn the heat up some more. Look at what their tight ends do. <laughs> you see what Brock Bowers is doing right now? He is a weapon, weapon, and they're raked around the same area. And Brock Bowers is like. Travis Kelsey in college football right now. So uh, it's, it's, it's the development, it's a developmental position, but it's that times 10 when it's the way Ohio State uses its tight ends. Yeah, Brock Bowers was basically the best offensive player for a national champion as a true freshman at tight end yeah. at Georgia. And Jelani Thurman left Georgia to come here. So that's a good recruiting job by Ohio State. All right, Nathan, 38 to pick to you. Whew. Still need safeties. I want to take a guy that I think is a little bit forgotten in Kai Stokes. A guy who, uh, you know, Jim Knowles has brought him up a few times over the years of a guy like, hey, like, don't forget about him. Like, we really like Kai Stokes. He does good things. He's a little bit like Jair Brown to me in a Mm. guy who can be easy to forget just because of the guys ahead of him. But there's been no indication that he isn't handling his business and is not poised to maybe be a really important piece of this team. Um, If not this year due to an injury that happened somewhere, then certainly by 2024, you would think he's on a track to be a starting safety. Yeah, I feel like I have Kai Stokes penciled in as a starter in 2024. Mm -hmm. Uh, All right, Steven, pick 39 to you. Uh, I'll take George. So, Steven... You need a tackle, a guard, and a quarterback. So you're taking George Fitzpatrick as your other tackle. Okay. Yeah. He's the guy who's behind Josh Fire at that position right now. I mean, I think if we're taking four tackles, then I think George Fitzpatrick has to be one of the four. So you heard the grunt. This is just the this is the situation <laughs> that the offensive line is in, um, and it is what it is. All right. Pick 42, Nathan. Who, who do I want to say we need to put some respect on more here? Um, I'll take Mayan Williams here. Uh, a guy, I mean, and I've been the one who is as much as anybody being like the one who votes on the Trevor Henderson upside over the two for a long time. But uh, the results were there when he was healthy and played last year. You know, he where would this offense have been last year? without Mayan Williams. You could say that maybe Dallin Hayden would have picked up the slack earlier than he did. We don't know that. True freshman. 
it's 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 a tough ask. And and Mayan Williams did some impressive things last year. So um, based on talent, probably should be taken higher than this. But this is where I'll take. Yeah, and the good football player draft, he's got to go higher than forty. But Travion was off the board. You could take a running back whenever, but we acknowledge Mayan Williams' value to this team, and you will see him at least for a little bit. They said on Saturday, Stephen pick forty-one. to you, Devin Brown? He's hurt. I yeah, I forgot that I He's still didn't. battling for the job. Yeah, I forgot I didn't officially but. take my quarterback <laughs> yet. So yeah. No, I mean you know you got all the time in the world. So uh, Devin Brown. I think most people would take McCord ahead of Brown right now, but we understand the the battle continues. All right, pick forty two to you, Nathan. Oh, uh, Josh Proctor. I mean, he's been who he's been with the ones running all spring. <laughs> so, <laughs> so he's been with the ones all spring. But let's let's say this that um, as much as people are saying, hey, he's doing a good job. He's come back. He's he's taking his shot his name doesn't bounce around in a buzzy way the way some of these other guys we drafted have. That's not, that's also not happening. So that would explain why he drops down here, whereas some guys have it. Which is hilarious because this pod, us three, two years ago, us Proctor is a top 10 pick in a draft like this. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, wild swings are a hallmark of Buckeye talk. Yeah. So, um, yeah, no, we should do, we can make a chart. Some of the, for, for, there's a listener who wants to go back and make a chart of where Josh Proctor has been drafted in various things over his six-year career at Ohio State. Uh, please send that to us. Final two picks, Stephen, for you. It's got to be a guard. What are you doing? So I've been sitting here on the old Google machine, looking up some stuff, getting research, finding information. And I found an article on businessinsider.com. It was written by Tony Manford. It was in 2015. and the headline of the article for anybody who wants to read it is the NFL is trying to wrap its head around the genius Patriots formation that no one has seen before. And the point of the article is in 2015, the Patriots played the Ravens and they came out in a formation where they only had four offensive linemen on the field. Oh, you have to have up to okay. now you have to have seven people on the line of scrimmage, but they do not have to have five offensive linemen on the field. And I'm saying all this because I am trying my hardest to not have to pick another offensive lineman because I don't know who to pick. And I am wondering there, Commissioner Douglas, if I can make like the Patriots and the greatness that they were in the 2010s and follow suit. Well, who? What did they have? An extra what if they only had four offensive linemen on the field? They had – Four offensive linemen, and they had another player who was lined up in a different part of the formation declare himself as the fifth ineligible player. Okay. So, like, you could draft Kojo Antwi, but you can't throw him the ball. <laughs> so, he's ineligible to catch it, okay. but you think he still might have more value on the field as an ineligible receiver than any offensive lineman you could draft. Well, this yeah, well, I was thinking more, maybe I take either Royer or G. Scott, and then not being able to throw him the ball is fine because that's what the Buckeyes do anyway with tight ends. <laughs> you just would rather have them blocking. I would than, just rather than have than them guard. blocking. I mean, you're throwing yourself on the on the will of the voters here. So okay. we'll, the truth will be told. So if you want to uh, explain your crazy formation, instead of taking, I guess, Ben Chrisman, who probably no, actually yeah, is the other yeah, guy I'm who's gonna... running – as I'm really the second team guard. Yeah, I'm I'm, I'm going to take Ben Christman here. I just wanted to continue okay. to emphasize the point that the offensive line is in a terrible shape right now. But yeah, I'll take a lot of uncertainty. I think he just wanted to go through all this process until someone else said the name of another offensive lineman, so you could say, "No, that's that's <laughs> who I'm going to take." <laughs> yeah. Yes. But I hope yeah, no, I these offensive said, linemen uh, listen to this podcast. <laughs> by the way, there's going to be some large listen, upset dudes, but, it, but it's on them to prove us wrong. Like I said. So the hard thing is. There's great opportunity. There's great bird at a place like Ohio State. There is great opportunity right now. The coaches are not talking in a way as if people are seizing the opportunity. But the coaches put a lot of guys in spots where they're being asked to overachieve because mm -hmm. of the program's shortcomings, not because of the player's shortcomings. So every time we talk about the offensive line or anything like this, please keep that in mind. This is not a bunch of five stars who haven't developed. This is – they did this to themselves on the recruiting trail, and now they're asking guys – and. 
you know, Luke Montgomery is not ready to help solve this as a true freshman yet. So this is what it is. Ben Chrisman and Enoch Mahi run with the twos at guard most of the time. That's what he'll take care of. I should have said, you know, so you're going to take Joe Royer instead of Stanley Flugelheimer. And Steven would have been like, no, I'll take Stanley Flugelheimer. He's the fourth guard, right? So because, again, um, who wants to talk about backup offensive linemen? Nathan, finish it off. you got to take a center. Yeah, I'll take Vic Cutler here. There's a reason why Ohio State went and got him. They had other guys who could be backup centers, um, <laughs> which is what we think he's probably going to end up being, um, whether that's Jacob James, whether that's like what, like Josh Padilla could be a backup center. Like they have other guys who could fill that role, but they saw some upside in Cutler and decided to, to bring him into the fold. So that's good enough for me. And that'll wrap it up as a reminder, the top 10 picks in this draft. Donovan Jackson, Marvin Harrison Jr., Emeka Abuka, JT Tuimolowau, Jack Sawyer, Mike Hall, Sonny Styles, Tommy Eichenberg, Lathan Ransom, and Ty Hamilton. Again, like there are just not a ton of sure thing All-American candidates there. But man, you can get about 35 deep with good football players. So in the end, these are the teams. And we're going to have our texters vote on this, who, who made the better team. The offenses. Nathan, Kyle McCord, Mayan Williams, Marvin Harrison Jr., Emeka Abuka, Jaden Ballard, Cade Stover at tight end, Josh Fryer and Tegra Shabola at tackle, Matt Jones and Enoch Mahi at guard, and Vic Cutler at center. Almost said Jay Cutler. Vic Cutler at center. For Steven on the offensive side, Devin Brown at quarterback, Trevion Henderson at running back, Julian Fleming, Xavier Johnson, and Carnell Tate at receiver, Jelani Thurman at tight end, George Fitzpatrick and Zed Mahalski at tackle, Donovan Jackson and Ben Chrisman at guard, and Carson Hinsman at center. Defensive side of the ball, where Steven leaned heavy. Defensive ends for Steven. JT Tuimolowau, Jack Sawyer, defensive tackles, Hero Canoe and Tyleek Williams. Linebackers, Cody Simon and CJ Hicks. Safeties, Cam Martinez, Sonny Styles, and Lathan Ransom. Denzel Burke and Davison Bignosen at corner. Nathan's defense, Kenyatta Jackson and Caden Curry at defensive end. Mike Hall and Ty Hamilton at defensive tackle. Tommy Eichenberg, Steele Chambers at linebacker, Jihad Carter, Kai Stokes, Josh Proctor at safety, and Jair Brown and Jordan Hancock at corner. I think Nathan has a better offense. Steven has a better defense. We'll figure out what that means to the voters and where they land on that. We hope that gave you a little glimpse of what we think about this football team at the end of spring football. We will be at the spring game on Saturday. Texting, writing, Post-game podcast, stick with us. The plan is to drop a Friday pod, a little recruiting, a little NIL. But for now, for Nathan Baird and Stephen Means, I'm Doug Lee Maurice, and that was Buckeye Talk.